Yay. <laughs> anyway, thank you all so much for coming. And thank you all for being with us on Zoom. Uh, we appreciate everybody being here. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Sally Lau, the parish administrator and the director of parish life here at Christ Church. Um, we started coming to Christ Church in about 1996, I think. And I became the church administrator in 1998. So I guess it's been 23 years that I've been doing this. Um, and we love it. We came to Christ Church by invitation. We had a, um, a, a neighbor of ours who was a member of Christ Church. And she invited my kids. Our kids at that time were in kindergarten and fourth grade. Um, I now have grandchildren, so that should tell you something. But um, she invited our kids to be a part of the youth choir at that time. And um, when we discovered that they were going to come and sing at a part of this as a part of this rally day celebration, I looked at David and I said, "My husband, maybe we should go visit <laughs> the church where they're going to be singing." We've been to the Catholic Church. Um, my husband was raised Catholic, um, and I had joined the Catholic Church at 19, but we just weren't finding a fit. And so we came that first Sunday to Christ Church and felt we were welcomed in the parking lot before we could get in, even get into the building. People were welcoming us in and showing us the ropes, kind of here's the prayer book, you know, here's here's how things happen. And um, we never left. And I was really surprised because I really thought my husband, being his, his family, I think is Catholic, like back to Peter, you know? <laughs> and so um, I didn't think he would ever consider going anywhere else, but we have been here and this is our family uh, and we love it here. So I just wanted to kind of go around and let everybody have an opportunity to introduce themselves and to tell us why you're here and what you, what you would like to um, what sort of what you expect from your church home? So let's start with Claire. Okay, I'm Claire Stratman. Um, I'm here because I was raised. Uh, oh, okay. Hi. <laughs> um, I'm Claire Stratman. I'm here because I was raised Roman Catholic as well. My husband was raised Lutheran. Um, we ended up here at Christ Church because, um, if, I mean, Episcopal Church is the the middle way. So. It was, Kind of familiar to both of us, the service style, and so we both liked it and um, just felt at home here. Um, and it's way past time for me to officially be received in the Episcopal Church because, I mean, I've considered myself Episcopal for years now. And um, yeah, it's about time for me to make that official. Hmm. I'm Jane McChesney, and I just moved to Temple from Round Rock, um, where I was a member um, of St. Richard's. Church, and um, I've been, um, I am a, a convert to the Episcopal Church, but it's been many years, but I feel like I don't know that much about the Episcopal Church, um, and I'm just looking for a church home here in Temple. Good. Great. Welcome. Um, I'm Cheryl Goodnight, and I've been coming here, gosh, for many years uh, to perform as a musician, and i uh, I feel very much at home here. I have a uh, United Methodist background, but I really love the Episcopal Church because people are just wonderful. They come from so many uh, diverse backgrounds, and I, I, I feel like that this is home, and so I'm uh, kind of just seeing what, where, and what I'm led to at this point, and I, love, I really love it here. I have a chance to serve and there's so many interesting uh, opportunities to grow. Okay, thank you. I'm glad you're here. Uh, I you. am Missy Ellison. Um, I think I've been here since December, um, mostly online, but I have been around. Um, and I have a background. Um, my family is kind of a mix of Baptist and Pentecostal. Um, but I got to be an adult, kind of decided that wasn't for me and went on a search. And that's how I ended up here. Um, and I have uh, my husband who works pretty much every weekend, um, and then her daughter Melody, who is two. And so I, I knew I wanted wanted something good for her and wanted a good community for, for all of us to be a part of. And so that's why I'm here. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Carol Booker. Um, my background has been a lot. It's been a 
Um, most recently, it's been with the United Methodist Church before they were, you know, with non-denominational non organizers like that, like that phrase after. Um, I went to Miller, I was introduced to this church back like a long time ago, because I'm from, I'm originally from Temple. Um, I was born and raised here. Um, and then I, you know, when I graduated from college, I moved away and now I'm coming back and looking for a church home. Great. Well, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Thank you. Hi, Matthew, and uh, my wife Margaret's on the call. And I grew up in the church, and and after we got married, uh, Margaret was been in the church too, so it's been about 10 years or so. And we've moved a lot, so we've been to Episcopal churches in Houston, and then Pearland, and then in Tacoma, Washington, and now that we're here. And so the main reason we, we just want to know what's distinctive about you know this church and opportunities to be a part of things. Hello. Hey, I'm Valerie Sanders, and I first joined the Episcopal Church in Guatemala, where I worked for three years. But the church there was very tiny, and I think we were lucky we had 15 people on a Sunday and really didn't have much opportunity to serve or be involved. So I enjoyed being here and uh, loved um, some of the groups that I've been involved in, like Sacred Ground most recently. And, but there's a lot of things I didn't really learn, so I'm, look, I'm looking forward to learning more about it. Okay, great, thank you. All right. Oh, um, <laughs> I'm Kate Lamar, and I'm there child, <laughs> and I'm 13 years old, and I'm new to Okay, great. Melanie? Mm -hmm. My name is Melanie. I'm going to draw this. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, I'm Scott Morrow. Um, I actually grew up in this church. And, um, you know, I uh, just thought this class would be, you know, fun to get to go over things. And, you know, you always learn new things all the time. So, uh, so that's what we're here. Great. Thanks. This is Morrow. And so we've been coming to coming back to Christ. Church, um, since we moved back to the temple um, about close to 20 years ago, kind of since we entered the team, but um, definitely have been more involved the last few years. We're also um, the youth group leaders here. Thank you. I am Michelle Key. Um, I didn't, until the last uh, year and a half, I really didn't have a church background at all. So I'm really interested to see, you know, and learn a little bit more about the church and okay. the background and whatnot. So great, great. I'm glad you're here. No. I'm going to proceed. My wife, her children over there. Uh, I was raised in the Catholic Church. They uh, were. <laughs> 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 I'm on tablets, so they were late. But yeah, we, we were looking for a place to go where I felt safe having my children come and um, also helping me get a place to use the community. Yeah, that's great. You're welcome. Okay, Kelly. Hi, I'm Kelly Buck. Um, I grew up in a family that did not go to church and I sent me on a quest for God. Um, I went to many different churches when I was growing up just to find where I fit in. Um, and then when I got a, became about 18, I found the Episcopal Church and I was baptized and confirmed at St. Christopher's. Um, mm -hmm. I moved to Temple. So I decided to check out Christ Church and it's been my family for about going on two years now. Great, thank you, welcome. Gloria? Well, <clears throat> I have actually joined Christ Church, been confirmed. I was a Methodist for a lot of years and we moved to Temple. Uh, we were looking for a fit for a church that we thought we'd be comfortable in. And um, a friend of, of Helen, of a friend, Helen Pickle, told us to come visit Christ Church one Sunday. And we did. And we stayed, my daughter and I, Amy. And so I found it to be a very uh, welcoming congregation, parish. And it's been, it's been really nice. I've enjoyed it. Great. Thanks, Gloria. Welcome. Margaret? Hi, so I'm Margaret Schwartz Moravec, and uh, like my husband Matthew said, he's there. Um, we have a three-year-old and a six-month 
six month old who is currently napping. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I've been going to Episcopal churches for about nine years. Um, but I am really looking for a place that um, we can get to know folks, get involved in community. Uh, we are new to the area um, and uh, we had a great community up in Tacoma at our last church. So we're really looking to um, find some of that here. All right, well, thank you, welcome. Well, I'm so glad that you all are all here. And I, one of the things that you'll find about the Episcopal Church is questions are always encouraged and welcome. So, um, you know, that's kind of part of, of who we are um, is a, oh, Becky, Becky's back there. We should end up introduce Becky. Deacon yeah. Becky. I do, I, I just do whatever Sally tells me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the Episcopal Church is a great place to hang out. Um, and especially, I will say Christ Church is a great place because um, one of the things that I picked up right from the very beginning from my first Sunday here, and I was looking to see if there was anybody that was at my very first Sunday here, but just open and accepting and you can think anything and come in and we'll worship together and it will be something good that will shape towards what God wants in his heart. Okay, well, great. And I've, I'm going to pass around, this is sort of like an agenda information sheet uh, for everybody um, that has kind of what we're going to be doing uh, over the next several weeks. Um, we will be meeting the next four Sundays in person in here for those that are at Camp Allen on the weekend of the retreat. I will be there as well. So we will schedule a time for the folks in here that will be at the retreat to get together and go over that same class that, that I'll then be coming back on Sunday and teaching to those of you who, are, who will be here. So nobody will miss a beat um, with, the, with the retreat coming up. And then on August the 22nd, that's our homecoming Sunday, and we'll be kicking off all of our new ministries and things like that. Typically that fourth Sunday, fifth Sunday, is when I do a, 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 a thing about getting connected and, and the ministries of the church and how you can become connected and involved and find family like we talked about. And so that's perfect timing because that Sunday we will all just attend and some of us will be leading <laughs> booths um, for homecoming Sunday. And there will be representatives from all of the different ministries that we have here at Christ Church uh, set up in the parish hall for you to go around and visit with and try to find your your niche, if you will, um, in the many things that we have to offer here at Christ Church. Um, and then on the 12th of September, we will have a special welcome at that service where we will welcome each of you uh, as some of our newest uh, people to, to be joining us at Christ Church. And then on the 19th of September uh, is when the bishop will come. And for those of you desiring to be confirmed or received, if you are in the coming from the Catholic tradition, and I think the Lutheran tradition, um, you would be received into Christ Church, not necessarily confirmed, um, but everyone else, if you're interested in being confirmed, received, or if you've been an Episcopalian for a long time and you want to reaffirm your faith, you can do that as well. So all of that will happen on the 19th with the bishop's visit at the 1030 service. So there's all of my contact information is on here. Our mission statement and vision are on here. So I'm just going to pass these around and you all, um, that, that'll give you just kind of a basic overview of, of what we're going to be doing. So the Episcopal Church is actually an American church that has an English heritage. Um, and according to the Bible in Acts 2.42, the, the uh, first Christians devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And as you can see by the worship that we enjoy each, each week, that's still at the center and is evident in our church worship today. So we continue to follow on the, the lead of the original uh, church back you know, when they first started dispersing out um, and spreading the gospel. So we, the Church of England, which is actually our original heritage, um, separated themselves from the Roman Catholic Church during the reign of Henry VIII, um, and they moved the uh, worship services from Latin to English because that was the, the language of the people, and they wanted the, part of the reason for that was because they wanted 
the, the laity, the people wanted to be able to participate in worship. Um, and with everything in Latin and them not being able to necessarily understand things uh, that made that difficult. And so they moved the services, the worship services to English. Um, they began allowing the lay people to have both the bread and the wine at communion. Prior to that, only the clergy could, could take, partake in the wine uh, during the communion service. Um, and the bishops be, were then appointed by the, the crown rather than the pope. So they had their own line of, of, uh, of bishops and that kind of thing. Um, it also was very important to the original Church of England that in, in individual faith and participation in worship is affirmed. They wanted the people in the church to feel a part of the church and not just as um, you know, people that were just sort of being spoken to and not participating in. Um, and so, and, and that goes back too to the early days of the church. Everyone was involved in worship in the early days of, of the church. Uh, they also wanted to um, stress that belief that salvation, the belief that salvation comes through God's grace and the faith of the believer, not from human merit or achievement. So we don't earn our way into heaven. Um, God has provided, he, he gives us his grace and offers us his grace and mercy. And by accepting that, we become his. So that we don't, there isn't anything that we have to specifically do. Now, that doesn't mean that when we have our faith, that we shouldn't live out our faith by, by action and things like that, but it's not our action that actually gets us uh, to God. And also the other thing that the Church of England did was our, the services, the worship services were defined more by a common prayer book and a pattern of worship, which we still enjoy today. So any questions about that part, the English heritage? And I'm gonna give you all at least one per family. This is a book, and for those of you, I don't know if you can see that, it's called Welcome to the Episcopal Church. Thank you, Claire. You're welcome. By Christopher <laughs> Weber. And this has a whole lot more information about the original Church of England and the, the Church in America and all of that. So this will give you a lot deeper uh, insight and, and knowledge about uh, who we are and, and how we worship and all of those things. Um, it would take, you know, we'd be spending a year if we tried to do all of this all, you know, in, in a class. So I'm going to give everybody, at least each family, a copy of this. Um, and, it, and those of you online, you can either order it or let me know and I'll get it to you. Um, so this will give you a lot more detail. So you can go through here. And then if you have other questions, I will tell you that I'm not the be all and end all. Um, mm -hmm. There are times when I will have no idea the answer to the question, but I will happily go and see if I can find out. So. So that's where, so that's how we get uh, up to the uh, American Revolution. So after the American Revolution, the process of establishing an American church began um, and Samuel Seabury was selected to become the first bishop and they sent him over to England for confirmation. Well, guess what? That wasn't gonna happen. So because he would have been required to pledge an oath of loyalty to the King of England, you can imagine how that was going to go over after we've just done the revolution. Um, they, he would not do that, and we could not do that as, a, as an American church. Also, I, this I find fascinating, the English bishops doubted that a church could survive without government taxes to support it. And so they couldn't imagine that people would actually support a church of their own free will. So they never thought it would, it would work, having uh, a, a, a church in America that followed that, that tradition because they didn't think that we as a people would support it, that, they, that we would have to be forced to support it through taxation. I just thought that was kind of interesting, but here we are. So Scotland had a small church with its own prayer book and bishops, and they agreed to uh, consecrate Seabury, but they requested that he shape the American prayer book after theirs, particularly to include the invocation of the Holy Spirit during the Eucharistic prayer. So we can thank the, the, and that actually came from the tradition of the Eastern Orthodox Church as well into the Church of Scotland. So we can thank the Church of Scotland and the Eastern Orthodox Church for the section in the Eucharistic prayer where we invoke the Holy Spirit to come upon the gifts. 
I thought that was kind of interesting too. Um, so the English Book of Common Prayer from 1662 was revised primarily by removing the prayers for the English monarch and kind of used to between that and the, um, the uh, Scottish prayer book uh, was how we formed our, our first prayer book. And that's been revised a couple of times since then as well. They chose the name Episcopal Church because that the Greek word episkopos means bishop or overseer. So um, the Church of England is called, you know, the Anglican Church. We are the Episcopal Church because we, we too have bishops and overseers uh, in the American Church. And we're governed by what is called the General Convention, which is comprised of the House of Deputies, which are lay people and clergy, and the House of Bishops. So when, when um, things concerning the church are being voted on or discussed or you know, brought out to be discussed, there is a, a, a section of clergy people, a section of lay people, and the bishops that all participate in all of that discussion and decision making. Um, so that's kind of just the basics of our uh, American Episcopal Church. So anybody have any questions or comments or thoughts? Becky, you have anything you want to add? Well, I was just looking at my phone because I actually watched there was some sort of presentation on the House of Bishops and House of uh, Deputies this week. Oh, great. I think they were speaking um, here recently. Oh, so that's okay. what I was just going to get to see. Okay. Uh, obviously, there weren't any big things to see out there when we heard about it. But that's what I was just teaching because they had some really cool music going on too. Well, that's all, you know, music is always good. Okay. All righty. Well, now to get into um, some of the anecdotes about Christ Episcopal Church in particular. So back in uh, 1983, we celebrated our 100th anniversary of the, of the beginning of our Christ Episcopal Church. And Weldon Cannon and I think um, Ray Virginia Allen put together this great history, a centennial history of Christ Episcopal Church. And so I'm going to read you a couple of little snippets out of here. Some of them I just find, you know, kind of funny. And, and so that'll give you a little history of how we came to be who we are here in downtown Temple, Texas. So... So Temple um, was basically a railroad town. The railroad came through here and that's what started to develop all of the Temple um, area. And the first Episcopal service in Temple was conducted by a missionary priest in a store with 15 communicants present. In 1883, the Protestant Episcopal Church set up a mission in Temple. So that's us, we, we began in 1883. Um, and then, they wanted to have their own building, of course. And so this is a little quote from um, uh, Mrs. Joe Harris, I think. It says, we sure worked hard in those days giving various entertainment, such as ice cream and strawberry festivals, pink teas, musicals and fancy drills in the summertime, turkey and oyster suppers and plays at the opera house in the winter, and finally raised enough money to build a modest church. What I find interesting about that is we still do a lot of those things today. You know, we still have our, our fish fry every year. We had we had the oyster supper. We do our music to help others, the musicals. So it's it's interesting to see that here we are 130 something years later, and we're still doing some of the traditional things that they did back in the day. It says Captain Harris was freight agent for the Santa Fe, and he used his influence and got the Santa Fe officials to give us a lot. This lot, donated by Railway President George Seeley of Galveston, was just about one block north of the Central Hotel on Fifth Street, now what, near what now is Avenue A. So Fifth Street and Avenue A would be sort of over around, oh, kind of across from where the Whistle Stop Playground and you know some of that area is. So the original church, I forgot my picture. The original church sat on. Um, the corner over there in that area. Um, and so then, eventually we were able to build the original church 
And it says, this is a quote from um, Mrs. Hewling P. Robertson in A Brief History of Christ Church. Parishioners were certainly not attracted to the church by the appearance of the building. <laughs> it was a little frame church with very cheap, brightly colored windows in yellow and blue glass, according to Mrs. P. Hewling P. Robertson. And I have a photograph on the wall back in the office area. When we go back there, don't let me forget to show it to you of that original, I think it's precious, it's so cute, <laughs> but that original church building that used to sit over here on, on Avenue A and Fifth Street. And it says the furnishings were scant and crude, the wooden altar tall and out of proportion, the benches were given by the Houston church, two low partitions screened the opposite front corners of the interior, one was used for keeping the few accessories, though no cabinet was provided, and the communion service sat on the floor. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Okay, so then we move on a little bit, and Temple was indeed booming. Christ Church was on the move, literally. In 1901, Mr. Sloan reported that some monumental accomplishments in the Diocesan Journal. During the year, he stated, we have had our church removed from the old site to the new, a choice location on Calhoun Avenue, between Main and First Street, where our building sits now. And so that was in 1901. They moved the little frame church over to this corner and set it, set it there. Um, and it says a rectory was also provided and furnished for Mr. Sloan on Calhoun Avenue and Main Street. So could be over here, there would have been an original rectory probably somehow somewhere on this uh, part of the block. So in 1902, Christ Church petitioned to be admitted into the union with the council as a parish, and the journal of that year noted, we welcome two new parishes, Trinity Church, Houston, and Christ Church Temple, into our council, both having paid off all old indebtedness and starting out with favorable prospects. So a mission church is usually one that can't quite uh, cover their budget. And when you become to the point where you are, are taking care of all of your budget on your own, then you become a parish of the church. So in 1902, we, were, we had the financial means to support ourselves and were able to become a parish. Right. So they, they started work on the, the church building that we have here, and there's some pictures in here. But um, in 1904, and then uh, it says that Sloan and Meisner, who were the contractors, waived their rights to terminate said contract and enter upon and take possession. Oh, wait, I'm going to take it back. The people that were building the church terminated their contract and said they weren't going to, they didn't want to finish it. So this other group came in and said that um, uh, they would uh, prosecute the work with promptness and diligence. They completed construction during the summer and the first service was held in the new building on September 24th of 1905. So last year we started with Janice's uh, uh, prompting a Christ Church Sunday, which will always fall somewhere right around that September the 24th, which is also part of the reason why on September 19th, we're gonna have the Bishop come. So that's gonna be a special, our second celebration, if you will, of Christ Church Sunday. So that's, that's where we ended up in the church right now. Uh, it was originally built in 1905. Um, and the, I'll leave this laying out here if you wanna look at some of these pictures. There's a picture of when they were actually doing the construction of the church with the stones and everything out there. Mm -hmm. So there are some pictures in here if you wanna take a look through there later. Um, so, so the original church building was completed in 1905. In 2002, we did a capital campaign and raised the money to build all of the uh, parish hall and all of the, the classrooms and the offices and all of that. Um, and so that was actually uh, completed in 2003. And one of the things, one of my favorite stories, two of my favorite stories about that, when the um, contractor and the architect came in and said that they could add on to that beautiful stone hundred and something year old church and make it look seamless, I laughed. I thought there is no way that they're gonna be able to connect to that and, and have it be as beautiful as this church is. 
Well, here you are. I was wrong. I mean, it is fantastic. You wouldn't know. I'll show you when we do the tour. You wouldn't know where one part stopped and one part started. So in, in addition to that, when we, when we added on all of the new buildings, the stones were pristine. They were all, we did all the hand-hewn stone, just like the original church. They were not machine made and they were pristine, but the church, of course, over a hundred and something years had weathered. And so the church looks so dingy and dirty next to these pristine stones that the decision was made to clean the exterior of the church. So we did, and about over the next month, I'd say, I must have gotten a dozen phone calls in the church office. I can't believe you tore down that beautiful old <laughs> church and built something new. What were you thinking? And I would say, no, 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 we didn't. We didn't. We added to it, and we cleaned the old stone. It's not new. It, you know, We didn't tear anything down. The people really, because it looked so different, thought that we had taken down that beautiful historic church and put up something new. So that was kind of kind of fun, you know, one of one of the funny things um, that, that I get to enjoy in my job. So in 2010, um, we the church, the inside of the church as well, needed some help. There were about six different shades of red carpeting on the floor, and um, it needed, you know, we they had expanded the my, my directions are terrible. The north transept had been expanded early on. Um, I think it used to have like a choir room and stuff in there and they'd taken down the wall and <laughs> Scott's mm -hmm. nodding, he probably remembers all that. And so um, so it, now it's lopsided, right? So at that point in time, the south transept was much smaller than the north. We had to go in underneath the building to shore it up because the original beams that were under there were railroad ties that were beginning to rot. We were really kind of lucky that we hadn't fallen through the floor. <laughs> so um, they, they had to dig out the, the south side so that they could get in underneath and shore everything up. So at, at that time, it was decided to go ahead and extend that south transept to give us more room, of course, inside, but also to make it where it was even with the north transept and all of that. So all of that was done in 2010. They took out all the old nasty carpet. We got a brand new organ. Um, we, uh, they put in all the, those beautiful wood floors that you see. And so all the renovations of the church building uh, were completed. I guess they were started in 2010. And I think we, we went back into the church, I want to say in 2012, and began worshiping back in the church. Yes, ma'am. Because I didn't know this. Okay. Okay. So have y'all paid attention to the way the design of First in there, yes. a cross. Yeah. And so that's that's one of the things you traditionally will see on a lot of the well, not all of the church. And I did not know, so I came over here on a North Chair transit and a South Transit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so if there's any uh, terms that you, you know, yes. it sounds a little bit odd, it's in your past. Yeah. But um, yeah, and so it is in the shape of a cross. Yeah. Yes, and it is. Thank you, it, Becky. Yeah. And it had gotten kind of misshapen when that one little part was kind of bigger than the other so now it now it is all proportionate so and thank you for that a lot of times you'll see that there's the easter you know that there's some some way that somehow the focal point of the church is at the easter oh. oh that's yeah. something i didn't know yeah. so that's kind of that gets us up to sort of where we are today with with uh the church we um uh, I'm trying to think, I'm not sure how many rectors we've had, but I, I want to say it's like 14, you know, in over the years. Um, you know, we're in the process right now searching for a, a permanent rector. We've had our interim rector, Janice Krause, has been here since um, July of 2019. Yeah, 19, I guess. So she's she was with us through all of the, the, uh, year and a half of COVID and, and um, she has been with us with some pretty difficult things that we've had to deal with this last year. So very grateful to her as our interim rector now. And of course, always look forward to who God has is calling to be our, our, uh, our new permanent rector. And so, um, so that's kind of, kind of where we are. Deacon Becky's been with us a few years, I think, right? Three. Three. Okay. 
And then Amy is our uh, communications coordinator, who's amazing. And so she's been with us since um, not long after Justin came. So I guess probably 2018, maybe 17, 18. So that's kind of our staff. Um, anybody have any questions? I feel like I'm just like the talking head over here. I do have a quick question. Yeah. So um, you're talking about the, you know, people got upset when you cleaned the stone because they thought there were new stones. So the stone that's on the church, church, like yes. the chapel, not where we are here. Yes. Is that still the original yes. Um, stone? Yes, it is. <laughs> that's really it cool. is. I'll show you where, when we go down here, I'll show you that part of the stone that's in the north narthex over here, which is another word for this big atrium area that has the skylights. Part of that stone was is from the original exterior of the church, and then you'll you'll be able to see going forward um, where where the new stones were were added in. So, anybody have any other questions at all? One of the most memorable times over here. Uh, this is a piece of history from about over forty years ago, but I was in high school at the time, and uh, we had a snowstorm. Nothing like. No, again, we had <laughs> this was a snowstorm where we could still all ride in the streets and so forth. And uh, uh, Temple College was putting on a box festival uh, where part of their uh, activities were held. The cantata was held at Christ Church. And one of the most beautiful scenes my mom and I have cherished it over the years uh, was the snow on top on the rooftop and the sides of the church. Mm -hmm. It was in November. Oh, gosh. You know, they. It was amazing. It was in fall of 76. There are actually, when we go down to the church office areas, there are some uh, paintings and I think some photographs of different times when the church was in snow like that. And maybe it may, one of them may have been that particular uh, one that you're talking about, Cheryl. So, it was amazing. Yeah. So, it was the most beautiful scene. Yeah, it, it, it is beautiful. Zoom folks, anybody over there have any questions or comments? Okay, well, so the next part of my um, of what we're going to be doing is taking a tour of the building, which obviously will be a little bit difficult for, for those of you that are on Zoom, but Amy is going to come back up here um, in uh, this week, and she and I are going to do that part again, and she's going to record it, and so we will be able to put it out there for you so that you all can enjoy that as well, okay? All right, anything else before we, yes, ma'am. Um, I apologize for, uh, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Teresa Braga. Yes. And I've been coming here, I'm sure that my first assistant, and I've been coming here up now for a couple of years. Yes. And I just see it so much, it's a beautiful church, and I really enjoy coming here to the service and the you know, praise and worship. Well, thank and, you. And, uh, the live music. Um, and it's very interesting. I'm glad I'm here. See the history of the church. I'm getting to find that more, and I'm really interested. In, and I, I really enjoy coming here, reading for here. Okay. For and I I was brought up Catholic. Okay. And I got converted, but mm -hmm. I'm finding it very interesting here. Okay. Which, you know, um, it's a beautiful church, and I'm glad I'm here. Well, thank you. We're so glad you're here too. Glad to have you here. Okay. I have a question. Yes. About how how big in terms of number of uh, you know people in the church currently and how has that changed over since you've been around? So we, if you look at average Sunday attendance, um, we've always hovered somewhere around anywhere from 120 to 180. We've been pushing that 200, you know, mm -hmm. I haven't quite pushed over to it yet. That includes both services. Yes, for both services. When, we, when we're doing, yeah, I should say pre-COVID, two services. Um, we were having um, probably, and, and hopefully when we start back up in, in the fall, um, and we will be on August the 29th, will be our first Sunday to have our two full in-person services again. So I'm excited about that. Um, and the first one will be at 8.30, it'll be right one. And then the second one will be at 10.30, right two, very similar to what we're doing now at 10.30. We will have edu Christian education in between the two for all ages. Our nursery will be open for the little ones. We've got Jennifer and Michelle and some of the folks that will be helping them. That'll be teaching the Sunday school classes uh, for the children. And then Nikki and Scott and Becky, I think, are, will be doing all the youth. So we'll have something and we'll have somebody teaching 
adult education as well. Um, so we'll have something for everybody. You'll all mention music. The choir will be starting back up with rehearsals soon. And so we are always welcoming anybody who wants to come and make a no joyful noise unto the Lord with us. We, you know, some of us are have, have zero prior training at all, but we come in and, you know, when you've got somebody like Gerald leading, you're going to learn and you're going to get better and better. And so even if you feel like you don't necessarily have, you know, a voice like Crystal, or Gerald, that's okay, neither do we. <laughs> so we'd love to have you for that too. Um, but anyway, so we're, we've, we've been kind of hovering around the 160, um, but I do know that during the COVID year, when we started offering the outdoor services, we've had a lot of families, a lot of people that have come along that are new within just the last year and a half even. So, um, you know, I look forward to seeing uh, where that where that takes us um, for the future. So, but yeah. I was going to say that uh, either you or Becky want to talk about the, the key differences. I'm sure you're going to go into it, but uh, right one and right two on our services. Good point, Scott. Yes, um, yeah. So right one is a much more traditional language service. Um, most of meaning the church of England back then. Right, and and a lot of the wording would be. Um, thou my servant and thee and you know thy um, it, it, it just has a much more traditional language. I'm going to bring prayer books and we can, we'll, we'll be talking using the prayer book in in the session on prayer. But I'll show you some of the examples of the differences in the language between the two. Um, right one is a little bit um, shorter, I think. Service maybe um, it, it seems to be a, a bit more contemplative in nature. Uh, than the than the right to service, but yeah, thank you, Scott. That's a great a great point. We'll go over that when I have the prayer books out here, and I can kind of show you a little bit of the difference between the two. The the, the flow of the services is is roughly the same. Opening him, you know, the reading of the word. Sometimes we don't read all of the lessons. We may read you know one or two, um, you know, communion and all of that. Uh, so the actual flow of the service is the same. It's mainly just the uh, the prayers of the people are done differently. Um, the wording is a little bit different, but yeah, we'll, we'll thank you. We'll, we will go over that. That's a really good idea. Anything else? All right, well, let's go for a walk. Oh, and here, I'm going to put these books out here. Please, please take one. Should I end this meeting? Yes, thank you. Thank you all so much.